Too short. (laughs) So today's reading is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 15, to the first uh, first verse of chapter 4. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favouritism. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So I've been invited to take us through week three of this series of Frontline Sundays. Uh, So far, uh, John has taken you through uh, weeks one and two about us as church being a people who are called to make a crucial difference in our world. And then last week, uh, this idea that God can meet us wherever we are and that each of us has our own place where we live and work and encounter other people, and we could call that our front line. Uh, This third week is all about whatever we do. Uh, Whatever you do, says Paul, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Whatever you do, Paul says once again, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Now, I'm going to try and be honest with you here. Um, One question that often makes me uncomfortable, uh, that very often gets asked uh, when I meet someone new, is that very obvious question, what do you do? Uh, What exactly is it you do? You know, it's a very obvious first question to ask uh, when you want to get to know someone, but I just don't really know very well how to answer it these days. I'm, I'm not in paid employment. My, wife, my life tends to revolve around my family, Deb, my wife, and Bethan and Johan, our children. I don't feel entirely comfortable saying something like, oh, I'm a house husband, because that just kind of, in my head, it just kind of draws attention to those things that I'm not very so good at, like uh, keeping the house tidy or DIY uh, gardening. Um, activities that I do kind of at best sporadically. Um, I, uh, I do, I do lots of cooking, shopping, lots, lots of church stuff, helping getting all kinds of songs and PowerPoints and things ready, sometimes writing sermons, some very busy weeks, um, some more free where I can do more music and songwriting and things I enjoy, but it's difficult to say exactly what I do. And I remember several years ago when we, when we last did this series of, uh, frontline Sundays here in Penrath. For some reasons, for similar reasons, yeah, I was, I was struggling a bit to see exactly what my frontline was. Um, things were a bit different back then, I suppose, as well. Um, I, I lived in Bethesda then, and I was, uh, just starting to get, uh, more of a sense of getting involved in the community there after living there for several years before the pandemic happened. 
And then we've moved to a completely new community in Hollyhead, which is very different. Of course, the, the last couple of years um, has been a difficult time for all of us, when it, especially when it comes to engaging with community. And if, uh, if this kind of frontline idea, if it's, it's kind of a military metaphor, I suppose, isn't it, that the word is kind of uh, it's based on this idea of fighting out on the front line. And, and if that's the case, then I think for most of us, it'll feel like we've had to retreat back to base um, over the last couple of years in many ways. It may still take men, many of us some time to be able to properly get back to our front lines after all the limits we've had on our social contact. But part of the point of this frontline series, I think, is, is to help us to see that we don't need to be employed as Christian ministers or evangelists or youth workers in order for the work that we do for God's, to be, in order for the work that we do to be for God's kingdom or to be part of our worship to God. Whether we're doctors or students or retired, whether we're unemployed or full-time parents or working in ASDA or KFC, the way we do our daily tasks is all important. Whatever you do, says Paul here in, in verse 17, uh, Colossians 3, 17, he says, whatever you do, if it's going to come on the screen, no. whatever you do, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does it mean to do something in the name of Jesus? Does it mean we have to start loudly name-dropping Jesus, whatever we're doing? I am buying this shopping in the name of Jesus. And one of those people who goes around saying, I wash this car in the name of Jesus. I think it's, it's helpful to, to step back and look at what Paul is really talking about here um, and, and look at the context. Throughout this, his letter to the Colossians, Paul, above all, is stressing the main point, I think, it's all about Jesus. Christ is everything. If you go back to Colossians 1, verse 17 to 18, he says this, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Again, in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And then a verse that comes just before our reading, which is a very crucial one, chapter 3, verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, uncircumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Christ is all and is in all. And it's from these um, massive, bold claims about how important Jesus is that everything Paul says in the passage that we've read flows. Christ is all and is in all. And so Paul is spelling out what that means in practice. It means that we need to become more like Jesus, adopting the virtues and qualities that uh, Jesus displayed in, in verses 12 to 14, he talks briefly about the, these, these qualities that Jesus displayed, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and above all, love. We need to put these on. And then in verses 15 to 17, the start of our reading, Paul writes about how Christ being all and being in all should work out in the way we do things in church, it seems. If we look at verses 15 and 16, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So here, as members of one body, in church, we should be governed above all by Christ's peace in the way that we 
relate to one another. That's a big challenge. Perhaps we each need to consider and ask the Spirit to show us what is ruling in my heart in the way that I, uh, I relate to other believers. If we have given our hearts to Jesus, does he still have them? Have we kind of taken our hearts back in some ways? If, it, if it's not the peace of Christ that is in charge, that rules, then what might it be? Might it be some selfish attitude or some, of, of some kind? Or a desire to manipulate or be in control or impress people? Or anxiously compare ourselves to others? What is ruling in our hearts? But if we instead let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, what might that mean? And be thankful, he says. Very short, very stark. But how thankful are we? Is there bitterness that we need to put aside in our attitudes? And then let the message of Christ, the word of Christ, Jesus' teachings, dwell in you. Dwell among you richly. Let Jesus' words go deep as you do these things together. Teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. As we do what we do in church, sing and focus on the word, how richly does Christ's message dwell among us? What might it look like? What might it mean for this message to take residence among us more richly? Then we get to verse 17. Whatever you do, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul has just mentioned some very particular things that the church might do together, teaching and instructing with hymns and psalms and songs. But as they say, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it. And after making those particular suggestions, Paul immediately backtracks from telling the church exactly what things they need to do with this very general principle again. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus and giving thanks to God. Again, if Christ is all and is, if Christ is in all, then anything Any activity you might be doing should be done in the name of Jesus. And what that seems to mean is that we do things as Jesus' representatives, as his ambassadors. And that's only possible through taking on Jesus' attributes, as Paul's been sort of talking about, and through allowing the peace of Christ rather than anything else to rule in our hearts. And then, in our daily tasks and in our relationships, we represent Christ to others. Because to us, Christ is all and is in all. So Paul is still, up to this point, holding back from really spelling out in practical terms what all of this means. But from verse 18 onwards, he does try to do that, using examples um, to show how this might apply to wives, husbands, fathers, slaves, and then masters. Now, it's at this point that we need to uh, take care and step back. Up to now, in what we've read, Paul has been speaking so generally that I felt free to talk as though he is speaking directly to us, that he's instructing us on how we should be. But of course, actually, Colossians, it's an ancient letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae, in modern-day Turkey, in around 55 AD. That's who Paul is writing to. And when we read these words, they're not exactly written to us, but to the church in Colossae in 55 AD. So, But we do believe that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these words are words of life that are written for us which we can hear and apply as a message of God for us in our very different context. Their world was very different to ours. They lived in the Roman Empire. Women had very low status. Children also were not valued. And obviously, slavery was one of the things that kept the empire going in many ways. There was an awful lot of injustice. 
But these were the key relationships that defined who most of the people were in in that community. And that was the context in in which these believers had to live out their names, had had to live out their lives, sorry, in the name of Jesus. That is, as representatives of Jesus to one another and in obedience to Jesus' teachings. So Paul here, he's giving examples of what it might mean for the people that he's writing to, to do everything in the name of Jesus. For wives, it might mean this. For husbands, this. For slaves, this. For masters, this. And that's important to remember because since this time, around 55 AD, our world has changed so much. And a lot of that change has been shaped by Jesus' teachings. Jesus' teachings have reshaped the way we think so much. Most people have little idea how profoundly Christianity has shaped our world and the way we think. But in in recent centuries, some some have abused verses like this, taking them out of context. Men have, have used this verse, wives submit to your husbands in order to control women. Likewise, some in the church have used the verse, slaves obey your earthly masters to defend slavery and keep slaves in their place. Whereas over time, actually, it was the Christian message and precisely the Christian teaching and values that did lead to slavery being abolished. But people who were slaves back then, they couldn't generally wait for that slow transformation of society to happen before they could live as Christ's representatives. No, Paul gives advice for what we can do in our current situation with all its injustice. To this advice to someone who's a, with a revolutionary mindset, it may seem very backward. It seems to be saying, do what's expected of you rather than fight for your freedom. But really, he's saying, in each instance, do whatever you do in the name of Jesus, as Jesus' representative, in the way Jesus would do it, and remembering that Jesus taught us and showed us a totally different way to live and a totally different way to overturn injustice. So in these verses, he tells wives and children what to do, to to do what was expected of them by their society, yes, but to do it in relation to Jesus, for Jesus, with Jesus at the center. Husbands and fathers who are in more privileged positions, he tells to be considerate of those who are not, uh, to be considerate of their wives and their children, and to to present Jesus to them in that way, to be considerate of the other in the name, in in relation to Jesus. These aren't easy verses to read, and we may wish that they were phrased a little differently, but by considering the context, I think we can see that that is the general idea. And then in uh, in the next verse, chapter 4, verse 1, sorry, I'm skipping on a bit, chapter 4, verse 1, Paul speaks to masters of slaves, Again, privileged people. And again, he tells them to be considerate and fair as representatives of Jesus. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven, a master who is Jesus. And in a similar way, those among us who are managers and bosses at work need to remember that we have a boss in heaven and that we should model the way we manage others on our God and and the way he is with us, the way he's so kind to us. But it's the verses written to slaves that are perhaps most interesting. Firstly, verse 22, chapter 3, verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. So again, do what's expected of you, but do it not just because you have to, but genuinely. It's a profoundly different way of seeing the situation. Let's look at the next two verses. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So slaves can be representatives of Jesus. They can reimagine their situation. 
They're actually serving Jesus here in what they do. And this is a principle all of us can learn from, especially if our situation uh, seems very unfair. Whatever we do, it can have real meaning if we do it as though we were doing it for Christ. Even the stupid and pointless tasks that we have, they can be transformed and looked at differently, and it can give our lives meaning. So if you find yourself working today for, say, McDonald's or Amazon or Tesco, you seem to be working for some big money-making corporation who doesn't really value you as a person. The tasks you do, uh, the tasks that you have to do in order to get paid may seem really pointless. In some ways, you are similar to a slave, but you can choose to see things differently. It's, it's possible to do what you do, Paul says, as an act of worship, working wholeheartedly instead of grudgingly and bitterly. Not because you love the company you work for or what it stands for, but because you treat the work as work for your Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Becoming half-hearted and bored or bitter in our work can be very damaging. Uh, many of you knew me uh, through those, my dark years of around 2006 to 2008 when I was struggling to do my uh, PhD here. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't really a subject, my PhD subject, that, that I was all that passionate about. I did it because there was funding for it and I'd struggled to find other work. And for, for two or three years, I felt kind of like I was a slave to my PhD supervisor. I didn't have the right attitude. I felt like I was a slave to my supervisor and to those who, who were funding the research. And I battled against procrastination, spending hours on end playing Scrabble on Facebook, but not really allowing myself to do things that I was really passionate about, like proper Bible study or writing songs. I was messed up in my, in my attitude. And in the end, I had to actually decide to give up on the whole PhD before I was able to come back to it and actually write up my thesis wholeheartedly. And in the end, I did really enjoy it. And I was pleased with the job I did. But I do regret those years of slaving under that bad attitude and the damage that it did. It was not my commitment to Jesus that I was living out of. And the peace of Christ was definitely not ruling in my heart. So if we believe that Christ is all and is in all, and if we believe that he actually is the head over every power and authority, then it is not a delusion to do all that we do wholeheartedly and in the conviction that we're serving Christ by doing it. And there's no such thing as secular work either in the sight of God. This whole sacred secular divide that seems to be there, it's not really real in, 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 the, in the end. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Paul uses that phrase, wherever you, Paul uses this phrase, whatever you do, twice in the passage we've read. Once in relation to church in verse 17 and once in relation to a slave's work here in verse 23. But there is no real difference in church or whatever, whatever we do, whatever you do can be done in the name of Jesus. How can we work out our faith, our commitment to Jesus in the things we do day by day. How can we respond to this? Think about the relationships that define who you are. For me, I'm a husband to Deb and a father to Bethan and Johan. That defines an awful lot of what I do day to day. I might be doing very different things one week to the next, depending on what is going on with Deb and her ministry. She has a very clear calling to be a Baptist minister in Holyhead, and it's exciting work, and I'm privileged to play a supporting role in that. It's very varied, and that's a crucial front line for me. Um, For you, it may be very different, and there'll be other things, there'll be other challenges I'll be looking forward to in 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 the front as well, but in what you are doing right now, what is it? We, re- we represent Jesus to the people who are in our lives. 
How can, we be, how can we be more considerate of those other people in a way that really does represent Jesus to them and shows the character of God? How are you going to respond to all of this? Is the Holy Spirit perhaps putting his finger on anything that needs attention in your life and the way you do things? We're going to watch the, uh, the short video which comes which, uh, from LICC. Uh, which gives some examples of the kinds of prayer, the kinds of prayers that you might want to pray as a response. So we're going to watch this video now. Father, help me do good today. I want to shape this place to your design. Help me see the value my work has to you. May I model your kindness and patience. So that you are recognised. Yeah, good. May they know Jesus through my presence. May they see your light as I share mine. Give me your joy and self-control. So that your warmth touches those I meet. Help me to be generous. Quick to put others first. Sharing clearly your love and grace. Give me words to speak about you. And courage to stand for justice and truth. Whatever the day brings. In my humanity. Weakness. Breakthrough. Let my life overflow with you. What difference will we see in our lives if we learn to see Jesus in the ordinary things instead of just the Christian things? If we really do start to see Christ in everything and in everyone. In a moment, we're going to sing our final song, which is Jesus, Be the Center. And the band are going to come up in to play that. But uh, as they come up, well, let's, let's, I'm going to say a prayer for all of us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and to show us Jesus in our daily lives and our daily tasks that we take for granted. We invite you to help us see our lives and our daily tasks differently. Help us to see the people in our lives differently, to see Jesus in others. Produce in us those virtues of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness, patience, forgiveness and love, so that we really can be people who are your representatives, people who help others to see Jesus. Lord Jesus, we invite you and your peace to rule in our hearts in all we do. In Jesus' name. <laughs>